Thank you for the introduction and thank you for all that are taking the time to watch this presentation tonight. And don't forget that it is recorded, recorded if you wanna look at it again. And I've already seen uh, the compost one, the spring gardening one. I enjoyed looking through their library catalog and seeing all the different things that we had to choose from. So it was real exciting. So we're gonna talk about container gardening. We're gonna talk about the basics and then we'll kind of go into some design features and talk about fertilizing and other things. There's a lot of information to cover. And at the end of the class, if you have any questions, be sure to type those in and we'll try to get to those as soon as we can. So just know that we have, besides gardening classes, there are a lot of other programs that are offered at the Sedgwick County Extension, Aging, Food and Nutrition, 4-H, Youth Development, Agriculture. And this is all part of the Kansas State Research and Extension through Sedgwick County. We have this slide on here and then I'll show it again at the end. Whenever you have a gardening question, you can always contact our garden hotline. And they're open from nine until noon and then from one until four, Monday through Friday, closed on weekends and closed on holidays. What you'll get here is not somebody's opinion or somebody who said, I did this once and it worked, but you get unbiased, research-based, evidence-based practice information. So the best way to take care of your garden and the best way to take care of it within Kansas. So you may read something that works really well in Hawaii or Florida or something like that, but it's not gonna work for us here. They also have an email address here. And so if you have a picture of something that you want to send them, or if you wanna just send a question that way instead of a phone call, you sure can. You can send a picture or you can even drop into the extension too. Um, if you have a bug that's bothering one of your plants or a tree that has some gall or something unusual on it, you can bring those samples in or take pictures and they'll be happy to help you with that. I just wanna remind you that K-State is an equal opportunity provider and employer and the programs and materials are open to all without regard for race, color, national origin, sex, gender, gender identity, religion, age, height, weight, disability, political beliefs, and I'm gonna let you read the rest of them, but um, equal opportunity. So welcome, this is me, this is my uh, sunroom. I have a wonderful room right off of the kitchen that gets uh, sun from two different directions, from the morning sun right up here on the side and then the afternoon sun. And with that, I have filled it up every spring, I have new seeds that are going. Every fall, I do my cuttings and bring them in. And many times I'll bring in whole plants um, from the outside. Right now, finally, that area is clear and I was able to clean it, scrub it from top to bottom. And um, it's ready to come for the plants to come in in the fall again. And here's some of my favorite types of plants, pink. So throughout this whole program, if you see a pink plant, you know that it's mine. I did borrow a couple of uh, pictures from some friends of mine and they're noted on those pictures. And then um, I tried to identify what the plant is the best of, of my knowledge on the bottom. So this plant that I've, the taller plant here, can you see my mouse? I'm not sure, but the taller plant here, um, when I bought it from the plant sale or from the plant um, garden center, they said it was a flamingo plant. And so I've had this plant for about five years. Just recently, I looked it up just to look again to see if it's better for shade or sun, just to read a little more about it. And it's not a flamingo plant. <laughs> so a flamingo plant has a different leaf, a different flower. And so I'm not really sure what it is. So if you do know, why don't you send me a message in the chat room and let me know. And then pink and patience, one of the things that you can never go wrong with, vinca for sun, impatience for shade. Sometimes I feel like I should clean the house, especially now that I am retired. I think I'm gonna go through every closet and go through every drawer. But as soon as I kind of get that idea, it goes away real fast and I go outside. Because even if it's to walk around and look for a weed, I'm gonna do that. I'd much rather do that. And it's so exciting because you never know, every day something new pops up. Every day something new blooms. And so it's always fun to be out and about. So this is something unusual that I just grew. 
This is one of my pots that was sitting in a covered area. Um, with my clay pots, I tried to move them in and um, outside of, out of the rain because that causes the pots to swell and expand in the freezing weather and breaks the clay pots a lot of times. So I had this one sitting on top. I had almost every other pot done except for this one. And I had those on the top, those are leaf scoops. So when you're picking up leaves and I pulled that off and a bird flew out at me and there was a beautiful little bird house or a little bird nest peeked inside and there were several little eggs in there, probably at least five or six that I could see. And then a couple days later, I peeked again. And sure enough, those little baby birds were alive and ready to go. So I guess I can say for the first time this year, I was able to grow some baby birds. I have not peeked in there anymore. I didn't want to disturb it anymore. Um, so I'll let you know how things go from now on. So one of the first things I like to think about is why do you want to garden in a container? A lot of people don't live in a home that has good soil around it. Maybe they live in an apartment or condo or the soil that's around your house is clay. I've lived in my house for 32 years and it was clay when we first moved there. And now after that many years and after me working in the garden so many years and amending the soils, I have a wonderful um, places to plant all kinds of things. It's also easier for the elderly or disabled. You can have a raised bed and so there won't be the leaning over the back pain. And then it's super fun for kids. This is my granddaughter and she loves to water plants. She loves to pick plants. She loves to do anything with grandma in the garden and with getting her hands a little bit dirty. Some other reasons are to control aggressive plants. One of my favorite uh, mints is chocolate mint. And I had an area in my vegetable garden that I had blocked off with two big pieces of wood on this one side and the other side to block it into a corner. And so I thought I was doing pretty good until my husband rototilled the garden. The, he rototilled the garden. And then before you know it, I had chocolate mint all over the place. And it took years to get that to come out. The good thing about it is it smells so good. So even when I was out pulling them, I could smell that chocolate mint smell. Another reason is just some of the containers are absolutely pieces of art. Uh, beautiful containers that are oftentimes the ceramic ones with paint on them. A lot of the clay pots are hand carved or handmade and just very gorgeous. To fill in blank spots. Right now I have some blank spots in the yard and pretty soon things will fill in there, but right, you may wanna have a pot and maybe even move it around. To cover something unsightly, I'm sure you saw a couple of rain barrels in my, in some of my pictures. So what I had for a little while was a nice um, trailing plant on the side of the rain barrel. Um, it kind of made it look a little bit better. And what I found was that with the wind, every time the wind blew, it was gone. It was right on the floor. So that didn't last very long. Instead, I painted my rain barrels. So some of them have sunflowers on them and some of them have some other flowers on them. When you're choosing a container, bigger is better. Um, it's a lot easier to take care of a two to five gallon container than it is to take care of a one pint container. Um, the reason is because they dry out so quickly. And so if you have a larger container, it gives it a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more um, backup reserve water for that. Ceramic, as you can see in this picture, I've got a blue ceramic. I've got a mixture of everything here. Blue ceramic, um, wonderful, beautiful. That's the one that sometimes when the pot is so pretty, then usually I'll just put something in there that's just green. Uh, just so that you can admire the pot as well as the plant. Clay, we'll talk about in just a minute. Plastic is turning into my more my newest favorite ones. And a lot of these pots that look like they're clay are actually plastic. Wood, I've not done very many wood pots. You have to be careful with those with rotting out. I've had a couple of metal pots, some teapots actually. And what I found was they are extremely hard to take care of. Two reasons. One is because they're so small, so you don't have a good reservoir of soil potting mix in there. And two is they just get hot and dry out so quickly. 
Baskets are fun. Many times with baskets, including hanging baskets, you may have a little bit of hard time watering them. So you might want to line them with a, a old plastic bag that has some holes punched into it. And then every kind of fun item that you can imagine. I've seen, I've tried. Um, so I've seen hats, boots, shoes. One of our neighbors had a child that was a basketball player and Bryce had a shoe size that was like size 20, a men's size 20. And so his neighbor planted one of his old tennis shoes with hens and chicks and that worked good. So anything that will hold soil, to hold the potting mix and that um, has good drainage, then you can use that. A lot of times these fun items, I would think of as more of a novelty. They usually don't last as long as one of your bigger pots will, but it's kind of fun if you have some people coming over and you wanna make something kind of special. So clay pots, they're probably the most popular. These are my friend Nathalie's pots and she has hundreds of them. And she is like, I couldn't believe all the succulents that she had in her pots. So these were the ones that were getting ready to be planted. And then she had several that were already planted. A couple of things about the clay pots that I wanna point out. One is that they are very absorbent. They will absorb the water. And so in the winter, that means that they absorb, they expand and freeze and contract, freeze and contract. And that oftentimes causes breakage of this pot. Another thing that happens is sometimes that extra fluid, that extra water in there causes this little crumbling of the edges of the pot. And it oftentimes puts a little bit of a patina. This is oftentimes from the water, the minerals in the water, or maybe from the fertilizers that you use. I kind of like the patina, the different color on there. And um, I still would use this pot and I still would love this pot. She will be planting it in succulents because that's her specialty. You can plant them in strawberries. It's called a strawberry jar, but you can plant it in herbs. I've had herbs in mine before. And then finally, when mine broke, I didn't have one again. The other thing I want you to notice is that tube that's in the middle. It's a PVC pipe with holes that were drilled into them. This type of uh, tall type of a pot is hard to be to keep watered, especially when you have different layers that go through here. And so it's very helpful to put a plug in the end of it and then water this pipe all the way through and then let it just soak out and get the, the water to the plants that are around the outside. Of course, there's the, the breakage. This is a very tall plant that was up on a shelf and the wind is just gonna crack that. And thankfully her plant didn't break, but certainly the pot did. There's the, one of the plastic ones that's actually probably one of my favorites. And it's because from a few feet away, it looks like clay. It looks like terracotta, um, but it's really lightweight and it does a good job holding moisture in and it still has big drainage hole on the bottom. And so that works real well. These plants are rosemary, vinca, and then actually this is a vinca vine to trail over the side. So a lot of my times I'll tell you to put in a scented plant. I love to have just a basil or um, cilantro or this rosemary or lavender. This one's lavender. No, this one's rosemary, I'm sorry. This one is rosemary. And it's nice to have that as you walk by, if you brush by that plant to have that smell come at you too. Um, the vinca isn't doing much right yet. Vinca annuals, they like it hot. And so it's not quite hot yet, but they should be perking up quite a bit in the next couple of weeks. I hear we have almost 90 degrees coming up in a few days. This vinca vine, it was in my garden. Sometimes when I'm doing a container and I feel like I just need a few more plants in there, but I don't really know what I want. So I wanted a trailing plant. So I found where the vinca was growing. I pulled some of that, dug some of that out and stuck it into the container. And sure enough, it grows just great on the side. I've also done that with hens and chicks before or with um, creeping Jenny. Um, oftentimes I'll have seedling starts in different parts of my yard that from seeds that were left over in the fall. And so just stick those in the container. This is one of my swim buddies, Nina, Nina. And she had several pictures that she had from her farm and her parents' farm. 
and um, they use a lot of old um, antique pieces of equipment like a watering can. This shows you a couple of things. One with the watering can with a metal, you're gonna have um, that it can heat up really good. This could either be, I'm not sure, this could either be a pot within a pot or maybe it's planted all the way through. If it's planted all the way through, they need to um, poke some holes in the bottom, drill some holes or nail some holes into the bottom so that it has good drainage. The other thing I want you to notice is that you've got a cooler spring flower in here. So these are violas and pansies. And so um, those are more short-lived. As soon as it gets up to the 90s, then they're gonna kind of fizzle out and die. And so then you can put some a different plant in there. So morning glories in here and just looks just as lovely as can be. There's a lot of different containers out there, new containers. There's bags, there's all kinds of bag containers. There's a lot of what's called the self-watering type of containers of every brand that you can think of. Usually these are pretty expensive. What they are is either a pot in a pot and the top pot will have holes in it and the bottom pot won't. Or this one just has a, like a barricade right here, a plastic barricade. And so what you do is you fill it with potting soil to the top and then plant your plants in there. And in the bottom here is where the water reservoir lies. And what it does is it wicks the water up as it's needed. And so like you can fill it up and keep it going for a week and then you won't have to water it quite as often. So I have just one of these on my back porch now and I planted a bunch of herbs in them. When you plant your herbs, put them really close to your back door. So if you want a little bit of cilantro, you can just um, open the door and use your scissors, snip some off, and then you're ready to go. So the next thing, we've got our container. Now we need to get our potting mix. So some people call this potting soil or soil, and the correct term is mix. It does not have any true soil in it. It is a mixture and about 99% of the time, it's a mixture of peat and perlite. Uh, peat is a wonderful substance that allows large particles to be in there. And so water will go into those particles and then drain off well. And so your plant will get the water it needs as well as the air, the oxygen that it needs. It'll hold on for a little bit and then let go after a while. The perlite helps with that helps with increasing aeration so that you can get the airflow in through there. We used to see vermiculite used more often. Oftentimes the potting mix had all three of these in there, but you don't see the vermiculite as much. There was some concern about inhaling vermiculite dust can cause some problems, but I still have some bags of just plain vermiculite. And um, as long as you keep, keep use it in a well-ventilated area, keep a mask on. If it does look like it's a little bit dusty, wet it down and then it'll decrease the dust tremendously. So when you go to the store, you need to choose, am I gonna buy the potting mix or the garden soil? The potting mix is light and fluffy and it works beautifully because of that, hold on to the water and then let the water go on through. Garden soil is heavy and oftentimes it, it may be sterilized when it comes in a bag like this, um, but it's not right for containers at all. It's just too heavy. You'll water your container. It, the roots will rot from being sitting in water too long. You may see some other additives. Check the list of ingredients on your bag as you get the bag. Probably one of the most common things that you'll see is fertilizer is added. Um, so if it says it's a potting mix and it says it has a slow release fertilizer added to that, then, then that will affect your fertilizing later on. I started adding compost this year. And so I add about a handful or so of compost when I'm using reusing my potting mix. We'll talk about that in a second. And that helps to um, increase nutrition and helps to re-fertilize, re revitalize that soil. Sometimes you'll see some little bark pieces in there. Oftentimes I'll use this, what's called the soil moist crystals or um, some crystals. They kind of remind me of the orbs that kids play with nowadays. What they are is a water holding polymer. And so when it starts off, it looks like 
big chunks of salt and you add a cup of water to it and then expands completely and fills up a whole cup of, of water into these crystals. The very first time I use this, I used too much. So I put this in, I mixed it up really good. I watered it in, I put my plants in and then I went out, went home and um, the, had rain all night came out the next morning and all of the plants were knocked out of the pot on all over the deck. And at first I thought maybe an animal did it until I started to look closer. And I had these giant water crystals that had blown up to the size of, I don't know, the size of a, a pecan or something. And so it moved too much of the soil out. The other idea with this is that when it releases the water slowly back to the plant, to the roots where it needs to be, and um, then helps with watering and retention too. Some people say soil most crystals don't work. So with this and with some of the other things, you'll have to make your own decisions on that, whether you do use that or not. It's kind of expensive. A small bag like this is probably about six or seven dollars. I use them every time I put the pot together. Um, I just, I have it and I like it, so I go ahead and use it. Some of them say that they have a wetting agent added to it, and that would be a surfactant detergent type of agent that's added to help with that water, um, first of all, absorption, and then um, letting it go. This block right here is a big block of coconut core, and that's sometimes used as an alternative to peat moss. What this little block is, is uh, very condensed, which you put it in a big bucket or big tray and then add um, a lot of water to it. And before you know it, you have a giant container of potting mix. And that works really well, just like the peat moss does. I've had people ask several times about hanging baskets and putting diapers in there. So a baby's disposable diaper has the same type of soil moist crystals, the same type of similar chemical in there. And so, but it's held within this area right here. I tried it once when I had a, a tower um, display and what I found was it actually made things much worse. My potting soil, my potting mix was completely dried out. My plants were very stressed and the diaper was soaking wet. It absorbed all the water, but it didn't give it back to the plants. So basics, let's, we're still on potting mix. Um, if I use the term potting soil, I'm sorry, but potting mix is the correct term or potting media. Um, can, you, can I reuse my potting media? Well, that's an individual's choice. To get the very best bang, use new potting mix, but it's expensive. And so instead, you may choose to reuse your potting mix. The first thing you want to do is check to make sure that it had a healthy plant in it and that it didn't have any diseases or bugs that were left over. If that's the case, if it looks like it's moldy or if you just had a lot of problems with that, then you may um, do better just to get rid of that and start over. Break up any clumps. If you are going to reuse, break up any clumps. And then one thing that I started doing this year is drenching it with soapy water. Remember I said there's something called a wetting solution and that may help with the water absorption. Well, with the old potting mix, one thing that happens is that it just, it just is like dust and it doesn't absorb the water anymore and let it go like it's supposed to. So if you drench it with a soapy water, this will give them a chance to get that surfactant back there that helps them with water retention. I usually take out the top about third or so and then put in my new plants and new potting mix and the handful of compost and some fertilizer. And then by then it looks just as good as the old potting mix does. I gave this talk on Tuesday and a couple of people asked more questions about reusing potty mix. One person said that she read to pour boiling water over the whole container of potting mix. 
so that if you have any residual bug eggs, that, that would help to take care of that. Um, another person said that they heard that you could sanitize or sterilize that by putting a piece of plastic over it and just letting it kind of cook in the hot sun. So either one of those would be some other ways to help with that reusing. Another question that we often get is, should I use fillers for the pot? I do not use fillers for my pot. I, because I'm reusing my potting mix, then it's got some of the old potting mix on the bottom that's been broken up and amended and made sure it's okay. You may have like a, a 10, 20 gallon and feel like you don't want to fill up that much with the um, potting mix. So if you choose to use um, empty pot bottles, empty water bottles, be careful with styrofoam peanuts because this kind will melt. And so you may think that you're doing, having a good um, filler and instead everything just kind of melts down to nothing. And then also with all of these, with especially with styrofoam, I'm worried about what kind of chemicals there might be on there. Um, so I personally don't. What I have used is an inverted pot and I'll show you when we go to some of the designs. So if it's planting time, you want to go to the store and you want to buy short, full plants that are not in bloom. This is as close as I could get to short, full plants. It is not leggy. It's not spindly. It doesn't have shoots that are coming off. Um, I just recently bought a whole flat and it was beautiful because none of the buds were on there. There, there were buds, but they weren't open. And um, the tag said light pink, my favorite color. And so I bought that and brought it home and it was when it was still cold outside. So it was in the garage outside, in the garage outside. And then it started to bloom and I was mad because the blooms were red. They're supposed to be pink, but they were red. So I did take that back to the store. It was the, the whole contain, the whole flat was still in perfect condition because I took such good care of it. Um, but they gave me a hard time about taking it back just because I didn't like the color. When you buy your plants, if you buy them from a place that has the plants sitting outside in the full sun, then you know that they have taken the time to get them acclimated. They need some time to develop sun leaves and to be used to the sun, the direct sun, and also the wind that we have. So every time we have wind, it kind of blows the plant back and forth. And that actually makes the stem stronger. And so you do want some plants that have been outside. If you bought some plants and they were inside the nursery or inside the garden center, um, what you wanna do is give them at least a week and preferably two weeks to get used to our sun and our wind. So what I would do is put it out for an hour in part sun and then take it back and then put it up the next day, put it out for two hours take it back three hours, take it back. And then that will prevent this sun scald that you see on here that the leaves can get and that causes then the leaf to die. You wanna tease those roots apart. This, even though it looks funny, this is actually a very healthy plant. The roots are starting to circle around in the pot because it ran out of room. And so what you need to do is pull these apart definitely get rid of that circle. And so that the, the roots will come out at just um, a nice curve and, and not into a circle right here. Um, sometimes you have to get real aggressive with these. And there's even times where I've just taken a knife and had to cut them to get them to pull apart. If you leave it like this and put it in your pot, then it's just going to continue to circle and continue to um, grow that way. And then Three months from now, you'll say this hasn't even grown. It hasn't even put a single bloom on. I wonder what the problem is. And it's probably just continued to circle. You need to clip flowers and buds at planting time. This is one of those things where you want all of the energy to go into root growth at first. You want good, strong, healthy roots. And then you'll have the plants flowering um, for you at, for a long period. And then cut back any leggy growth. There's no really leggy growth on here or in the last one that we saw, but sometimes you get a plant and it's just got um, just extra kind of spindly offshoots. Cut those back 
what it does is two things. It uh, tells the plant to branch out more and to grow bigger and better. And then um, those little things that you cut off, oftentimes, instead of putting them in the compost, I put them in some potting mix and grow some new plants from that. I can only do that for myself. Um, you can't sell those um, because the plant manufacturers put a lot of money into getting those plants as big and healthy as they can. Make sure that you plant at the same depth that it was in the pot. If you just make too small of a hole or have the top of it sticking out a little bit like this, then you're gonna end up with a dried out plant. This one you're gonna have, again, shallow plant, shallow hole. This is planted way too deep and that will, prob that will probably kill the plant. The only time you can do this is if you have a tomato. So a tomato plant will grow roots right along the stem there too. So you want to make a big hole. You want to make like what they say a $20 hole for a $10 plant. So make it really big and full and make sure that you have um, loose soil below there so that it can grow out in all these different directions. So my neighbor Suzanne was outside and I saw her and I saw that she was starting to do her pots. And so I said, can I take some pictures? Because as I was doing my pots, I couldn't take pictures of myself doing them. So she said, okay, she would do that. The first thing she did was she emptied all her pots into this big purple container. And then she mixed the uh, potting mix, broke it all off, got rid of any kind of twigs or sticks or anything, and then added half again as much of the new potting mix into there mixed it all up really good. So she reused, but she also added the new to it. She took her pots and she washed and scrubbed every single pot. And then she dipped it into a bleach solution, let it rinse off, let it dry. And so she had the cleanest, nicest pots that you can imagine. So actually that's probably what we should be doing. In reality, I have never done that. Every once in a while, if I'm doing some cuttings and I want a real sterile container, I will do that with um, the pots that I use for that. So like some plastic reusable pots that I got from a garden center or somewhere, I will scrub those out, clean those, and then dip them in a 10% bleach solution. But she did that. She did a, um, had everything. It looked like a brand new pot. Then she covered the bottom hole. She used shards of broken uh, pots right there. What I um, sometimes I'll use coffee filters. Sometimes I'll use um, a little rock or something. I don't want to obstruct the flow of water, but I do want to prevent that fine potting mix from going out through every time I water the plant. Especially when you first get started, um, it doesn't have root growth yet, and so any potting mix is going to come out every time you water. So that's nice to have something to stop that. Then she started to fill that in from the bottom. She got her plants ready and she see how she how gently she tipped it onto her side. Oftentimes you need to squeeze that pot a little bit to loosen up the roots that might be sticking to the sides and then pulling that straight out, still supporting the plant with your other hand. Um, very gently teasing those roots apart even though there weren't a whole bunch of roots that were encircled, um, she still made sure that any roots that were kind of twisting around were kind of pulled out from the plant. And then she went ahead and put that plant in at the same soil level where it was in the pot and then backfilled with some new, some of the um, potting mix that she had and so that it was all at the same level. What I often do with these labels, there's two things I do. One thing is I'll stick one into the side of the pot here. So if I wanna know exactly what geranium was that that I had this year because I loved it or I didn't like it and I wanna make sure I make the right purchase next year. So I put it in the, the pot, but I also have at home a notebook. It's just a spiral notebook and it has every plant label and where I got it from and um, so, a lot of, oftentimes with perennials, people will want to know three years later, what was the, what was the cultivar of that, that bellflower? And I can't remember, but I can go back in my notebook and look at that. 
So then she said, are we done? And I said, well, there's a couple more things we can do. And she said, well, what do we, what can we do? And I said, we can mulch it. And she said, I've never heard of that mulching. Yes, you can mulch it. You fill your soil up so that there's probably two inches left at the top because you wanna have some room for watering. And then put in a layer of mulch and it does the same thing that mulch does for your gardens, um, for your perennials, for your annuals that are put into the ground. It keeps the soil temperature stable and it keeps the moisture level stable. And so it will actually make your plants um, do a lot better in a pot. Remember one of the things about a pot that you'll have more trouble with is watering. And so that mulch may help you with that. So she said, okay, she would put some mulch in there. And what kind of mulch? I said, any kind of mulch that you have would be fine. Um, just laying it on the top is not going to pull nitrogen away from the plant. Sometimes if the mulch is mixed up in there, they say you worry about nitrogen being pulled away as it decomposes, but on the top, it's going to be okay. She said, what else? I said, well, you want to make sure you water it in thoroughly. Um, water it in. You don't want to compress the soil. You want it still to be light and fluffy. The watering itself will kind of move it down a little bit and get rid of any air pockets that you might have. She said, okay, she would do that. And I said, and fertilize it. So go ahead and fertilize it. And we'll talk about fertilizing in a few seconds. But um, she said, I, I have some quick release, some liquid fertilizer granules that I can mix up and pour in there. I said, that's fine, do that. And then she said, what else? I said, well, you can cut every bud off and every flower off. She said, what, are you kidding me? Cut off every flower, every bud. And she was just like shocked. I said, yeah, cause you really want the energy to go down to the roots. I said, it's your choice. Just like everything else, just like the color of the plants that you chose, the container that you chose, it's your choice on what to do. And she thought about it. An hour later, she yelled across the yard. I did it. I cut off all the old blooms and what I always do is just stick them into the pot right next to it so that I can still enjoy it. Now you mulch and water and enjoy. These are the grandkids. And if you see, as you can tell, there are more ornamental things in there than there are plants, but they loved it. They loved every minute of it from breaking up the clods of dirt to picking out which plants that they wanted to put in. And then they spent the most time on there decorating. Kids love things if you tell them it's like, let's plant a salsa garden in our pot. Let's plant a pizza garden in our pot. Some of the things that they love, spaghetti garden. And so tomatoes and garlic or um, cilantro or whatever it is that you want to put into your pot, they would think that was the most fun and enjoy it and enjoy watering and enjoy helping you take care of that. So probably the thing that's hardest to do is knowing when to water. With my house plants, I tend to overwater. With my outdoor plants, I tend to underwater. And that's really common for everybody. So the best thing to do is to check it every day. And sometimes if it's 100 degrees outside, you may need to check it twice a day. Stick your finger in there about two inches or so and feel the soil, feel the um potting mix and see if it's moist or if it's dry. If it's dry and crumbly, then you need to water. If it's moist, you don't. People ask me, well, how often do I water? Do I water every day, every week? And there's no correct answer to that. The best way is when it needs it. And another thing that you can do is use a soil moisture meter. So I bought one of these and I do use it, you know, when I had all those trays and have eight pots in one tray and multiple trays, it was a lot faster for me just to stick it in, check, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. And then I was able to check all of them within a matter of seconds. And sometimes I would just be surprised because moist, 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 dry, moist, moist, moist. And it was weird how one plant would be dried out completely, maybe on the edge or in the middle or something, and the other ones would be fine. The best time to water your plant is in the morning. The reason for that is because it's getting ready to take on the stress of the day. And so when it gets to be 100 degrees, you want to have a good, well-hydrated plant before that happens. 
Also, you don't want water to be left if any splashes on the leaves, especially like overnight. If you leave water on the leaves, and especially overnight or long period of time, what's gonna happen is it's gonna get a fungus on there and uh, powdery mildew, something like that. It's going to just rot on you and um, it doesn't like that water on there. It helps when I make my pots and do it the first time, I try to make sure that I don't have it domed up, but instead have just either flat or just a little bit of a curve to it. And the reason for that is I don't want the water to come down and then just to go over the edges. I want the water to go in and soak straight in. Um, this really helps, um, especially if like you miss a day and it does get too dried out, then this will be the good thing to do. Water slowly and thoroughly until water comes out of the drainage hole at the bottom. So with our pots, we like bigger is better and it has to have a drainage hole in the bottom. Oftentimes what I'll do is I will start on one end of my deck or my um, wherever I have the pot sitting out, water one through 10, and then start back over with one again and go through a, to 10 again. And the reason is because it may just water the top half. And then when you water the second time, it'll go on through the rest. Don't use a saucer on these. If you um, use a saucer, it's gonna hold water in like with all the rain that we've had, it's gonna hold the water in and it'll cause root rot at the bottom of the plant and going up. And be careful with pots that sit directly on the deck. Um, it could stain a deck. But the other thing is that on my deck, it, um, it has some low spots. And so if I have the pot sitting directly on the bottom, it's gonna be sitting in water for, for at least several hours more than I want it to. Fertilizing is real important. You need to fertilize it as you plant it and probably more often than that. Um, what one of my friends does is I said, how are your plants always so beautiful and flowers so big? And she said, fertilizer Friday. Every Friday she does her fertilizer. So I started doing that and sure enough, it really makes a big difference. It's a time for you then to um, fertilize. Some people even fertilize more often than every other week or twice a week. I still do just one time a week. I use two different methods. I use the slow release um, little, be little balls. What happens with these is then when they get warmed up and when they get wet, then they start to slowly release fertilizer. You'll have to check the container because it may be over two months or it may be over six months that it does that slow release. And then make sure you follow the directions because it'll tell you how many tablespoons or teaspoons to put in based on the size of your pot. Or I'll use a water soluble. And so this is one usually you'll put one tablespoon in one gallon of water. I'm gonna do it half strength though because I'm doing it more often than uh, bi-weekly. And so with this, what I do is one tablespoon in a two gallon uh, container watering can. There's different instructions on different sites as far as um, wh what the NPK um, concentration is that's the best. So the three main ingredients in your fertilizer are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen helps to green up the plant. Phosphorus helps with roots, but also fruits and flowers. Potassium keeps the plant strong. So K-State recommends three, one, two mix. So this one is 18, six and 12. So that would convert to a three, one, two. Um, if you did it, it could be 15, five, 10. So, but you kind of see that how that works. Usually your first number, your nitrogen is never higher than 20 with our fertilizers. And then kind of look and see how your plant's doing. 
If you find that you have a lot of green, you may be using a little too much nitrogen. Oftentimes, like with my hydrangeas, I think that the reason they don't flower as well is because maybe I have a little bit too much nitrogen on them. And so then you may want to switch over to an all-purpose 20-20-20 or 10-10-10. So those first three numbers are 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, and 10% potassium. There are other things in there too. So nitrogen phosph phosphate and potash is potassium. Um, smaller, um, minute amounts, magnesium compared to the amount, the 20-20-20. So magnesium, copper, iron, um, different types of other mac micronutrients that the plant may need. So, but three, the top three are the ones that you usually want. Fertilizing a pot is totally different than fertilizing in your garden. With a pot, you have a one that the water goes through very quickly and every time it goes through, it washes that fertilizer out. So that's the reason why we're fertilizing more often. But in your plants that are in your garden, you don't wanna do that. You want to do a soil test and find out exactly what they need and only put that in. Um, so you may just need a little bit of nitrogen, may not need any phosphorus at all, and you may need a little bit of potassium. So that's where some of the different uh, strengths come in in different, different fertilizers. I want you just to start looking at those fertilizers and looking at those numbers. So lawn fertilizer is 3004, or maybe 3000. What that means is it's all nitrogen. So we want our lawn to be green. And so that's why you would use this. You would never use this on any of your plants, um, any of your um, container plants, because that's the wrong combination for them. When I use my two gallon container, then I always have like a sticker or a ruler to help mix it up in there. Cause I don't like it when the first few pours are just pure water and at the bottom you can see more of the fertilizer that's in there. Another thing I do is I put a golf ball in my container and what that does is helps to mix it up and to keep it in suspension instead of letting it uh, kind of sink down to the bottom of the container. If you are an organic uh, gardener, um, oftentimes you will have a totally different fertilizing program. And with that, many times it's composted material. Um, what it does is it amends the soil over time. It's not that quick release of fertilizer. You may have to wait just a little bit longer to see those, but it's, um, you it's just as easy in a liquid form or in something that you add to it. So every day I'm going to check for water requirements. I'm going to pull off any dead flowers. The reason I do that is because I don't want it to go to seed. I want it to continue to develop new flowers. If I let it just go to seed, then it stops flowering and it thinks the plant's done. I want to replace any plants that are out of season, like the pansies that we saw earlier, and pinch back any leggy growth. So one thing you'll see sometimes are yellow leaves. I saw this on um, a joke that was on Facebook, but I couldn't copy it because it had some bad words in it. But what it said was yellow leaves, is it too much light? Not enough light. Is it too much water? Not enough water. Too much fertilizer? Not enough fertilizer. Too hot or not warm enough. The last line that it said, or the plant was just being um, difficult and not doing what you needed to. But if you do have some yellowing of your plants, then kind of look over those, those things right there. Um, is it a sun plant and I have it in the shade? Um, am I underwatering or overwatering? And then am I considering the fertilizer on a regular basis? So let's talk about some design principles. Um, again, pink flowers, you know they're mine. Have an area of focus. So your eyes are kind of drawn to here. Balance the number of pots and plants odd number of plants. Many times when you're putting together a container, you'll use the number three or the number five number of plants in there. It just makes it look more finished. Vary the leaf texture. So you may have giant leaves like these cannas and then smaller leaves and then spiky leaves and all kinds of things together. 
and then include a scented plant. There's some really pretty basils um, and different kinds of plants that you, as soon as you walk by, if you touch those plants, then you'll it'll release that scent and you'll just love it. Tie the plants together. These are similar plants in similar clay containers, uh, maybe the same color scheme. And this is my friend Nathalie's. Um, she got her plants back going again. And, and make sure that you're careful about the sun or shade requirements. Another design principle is what they call the thriller filler spiller. Um, this came out like 10, 20 years ago. And so then everybody was doing thriller filler spiller. And now it's just whatever you want. If you want just geraniums in there, then you can certainly do just geraniums in there. But a lot of times when you're first starting, you don't know what to do, then this is a good way to plant your plant. Your thriller is your tall plant and how tall it is depends on the size of your container. So if you have one that's just six inches tall, then um, a tall plant may be just a asparagus fern that you see here. And then on this one, actually I did then a tall plant, but then two fillers. Um, this geranium has a beautiful white flower that turns to a pink. And so I thought that just coordinated so well with this coleus here. One thing about asparagus fern, these take over your pot. And one thing that um, another master gardener taught me, Peggy told us to keep your asparagus fern in the plastic pot and pot that whole thing with the plastic pot on it. And so that's what I did with this. That's what I've done in the last few years. And I didn't have then that asparagus fern taking over the plant and then taking up all the space. When you have any kind of tall plants, watch for tip over. And what this is called is the thriller because it kind of catches your eye and it's the first thing that you see. Filler plants, lantana, one of my favorite plants and especially if it's pink. And this is just one plant in a big giant pot um, that just filled in and filled in and filled in. There's different kinds of lantana. Some of them keep a little bit smaller, but this one was, I didn't realize was such a big one. Um, asparagus fern. Now you, you saw me call that a thriller just a second ago. So it just kind of depends that many of these um, will fall over into several different categories. Geraniums and petunias are two plants that I still use a lot of. Um, I've not had problems with it, but many people have problems with bug worms with those. And so if you do have problems, there's lots of other plants that you can choose from. Trailing plants, um, Bacopa is really nice. Creeping Jenny, remember I said that Vinca vine is oftentimes what I'll just pull out of the ground and put in there to have something. It softens the edge of the pot and just kind of pulls it all together. The types of plants that you use are everything. So here you see um, a combination of house plants as well as annuals, and then a couple of perennials, grasses and herbs. And then you can always do fruits and vegetables as well as trees and shrubs and house plants in there. If you do put a perennial in a pot, then um, this one's wonderful. This one's actually from the internet, it's not mine. But um, you need to just kind of think about at the end of the season, you probably would do better to take it out of the pot and put it into the ground. It's more likely to freeze and have damage to it if it's in a pot and elevated like this versus if you go ahead and put it into the ground. Herbs, different kinds of herbs like different kinds of weather. So most of them like it hot and dry and low fertilizer. They like poor soil conditions. Some of them don't like that. So basil would be an exception, it likes it moist. Uh, cilantro has a long tap root. So oftentimes you need a long, either in the ground or a, a pot that it can go real deep in. Lavender and rosemary, hot and dry. Mint to keep it contained. And this is something that I did for the granddaughter. So parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And I definitely sang it to her every time I came over. Vegetables can go in. Consider a very large container. Even though they're not beautiful, you can use just a five gallon bucket and make sure you have drainage holes in the bottom. They work wonderfully or consider doing some dwarf plants. And so when you look up the plant, um, if it says it's a patio plant, a patio tomato or dwarf 
um, tomato, then that would be some good ones that are good. These are um, some of those big boxes, the big containers that have that reservoir of water in the bottom. So another reason for gardening in a container is you have a short gardening season. My daughter Amanda and her husband Jake live in Colorado. And so their growing season is only about two months long. Whereas we have a growing season that's six months long here. And we're lucky that we can keep things out from about, October, about April to October. But look what, what she sent me a picture of just a couple of days ago that their plants are starting to produce already. Cherokee is usually a really big tomato, but um, they got they have red tomatoes. And so I'm really kind of jealous of that because I just barely have tomato plants in the ground. And uh, so that's another reason for a nice container garden. With your colors, there's different things you can do. Uh, some people like hot colors. So on this side would be the hot colors. Um, some people like the cool colors on this side. And then just kind of think of what do you like and what pleases you. My favorite are the pinks, but I also have some yellows and whites and maybe some purples. So those are um, more pastel colors that I like. So if you want to, you can do a monochromatic color scheme. So this is my front porch, one color, but different shades. It's very soothing. These are two different kinds of begonias, but they both have double flowers. And this is right outside of, this is actually in the ground, not in a pot, but this is a annual poppy that comes back every year with this double pink, um, beautiful, gigantic head. This is a backyard. And when my two kids were little, they each had their own garden plot and they got to pick out what flowers that they had in there and got to help take care of it and water it. And so Amanda's garden was always the hot colors. And what she wanted were always red, orange, and yellows. And so this is her garden. These are not pots, but it kind of gives you an idea of the color scheme that we're talking about with the hot colors. You can choose colors on the opposite side of that color wheel. So here you see violet and the opposite of that is yellow. And so this the violet and then yellow and a couple of different shades of yellow. So that looks really nice to have complementary colors. Some people like to have neutral colors, all of one color, so all white flowers on there. Some people have even a white garden, they'll call it a moon garden. And then some people like the, just the wild, everything that goes in there that goes. And so what you need to do is do what you love and love what you do and enjoy it. Make sure, some reminders, make sure the plants have the same requirements. So if you look on the tag and it says full sun, then make sure all the plants that you put into that container are full sun and they actually get full sun. If it says part shade, make sure that all the plants have the same requirements in there. Check that container daily, mulch. Don't limit yourself, um, but some of the easiest plants to grow are impatience for shade and binca for sun. Include foliage as well as flowers. You don't have to have a bunch of flowers in there. Um, sometimes it's just as beautiful to have just a bunch of green. This is one thing I tried one time, an inverted pot and then the pot on top. This, this is not my picture, this is from the internet. And just that's how they make these towers. So what they do is um, instead of putting styrofoam or anything like that, maybe a pot and upside down would help to hold that up. This is my yard. Um, oftentimes I have this shelf unit that's in the garden and I'll just put that kind of in the middle of the garden where it's kind of a blank spot and put containers in there. One year I had a whole bunch of white enamel that was from a hospital that were old hospital pieces of equipment. And yes, I even had a bedpan. Um, for all of those, I, what I did was I had to dr drill holes in the bottom and I kept it in the shade um, so that it would do okay. I finally got rid of them because I thought, eh, I, I guess I don't like having a bedpan in my yard after all. I also had teapots for a while. So um, 
my father-in-law gave me the first teapot he had out at the farm and I loved it. And so I put some plants in there. The rose moss did really good. Then as soon as people heard that, then they started giving me teapots. Every time they would go someplace to a thrift store or garage sale, they'd buy me teapots. So I had teapots all over. This is in Amanda's garden again. And I quit doing that too. Two reasons. One is it's a small container. And so it's a little bit harder to keep it watered. And then it's metal. And so it gets real hot, real easy. But these are fun to have. A wagon is always a real nice container to have. Uh, this was a giant clay pot that I got from one of the big garden shows that we used to have. And it was one of my favorites until it broke, of course, from being outside. I just didn't have enough room in the garage to put all my pots. And so I kind of left them out during the year and I learned my lesson on that one. So this is your asparagus fern in the front and my favorite, this bubblegum petunia in the back. Now we talked about petunias a little bit. Um, they may get that bugworm. I've not had that problem so much, but like if you have bugworm, then find a different plant. Don't try to fight with that. Um, and then the other thing with petunias is they look gorgeous and then they just get just kind of green and no flowers and just kind of long and leggy. What you need to do is take some scissors and just chop it way back so that it's like a real severe haircut rewater, refertilize, give it a, a week or two and you'll start seeing those buds and those flowers come back. From my friend Nina's, uh, she, her mother-in-law has some old equipment that's outside. These are those white enamel type of things that I used to have some plants in. Um, so she has a beautiful display there. Tack, or stacking or tumbling, sometimes these are popular. So these looks like herb garden, just it looks like the flower garden just kind of fell over. This is not my picture, but it, I had this exact same thing for just one year. So a large pot on the bottom and then tilting pots in smaller sizes as it goes up. And then a, this is a pole that goes through and it goes all the way into the ground to kind of stabilize it. And this is the one where I had so much trouble watering. When a plant is tilted like that, it's hard to get it to water into the middle. This is the one I had the, the diapers in there and the diapers are the only thing that got good watering. Nothing else got watered. This is my friend Nathalie's gardens. She is like the succulent queen. And look at that. Who would have thought to have succulents in a hanging basket like that? I don't think I've ever seen that before. And I just thought that was gorgeous and all the different containers that she has. A lot of face containers with wild spiky hair coming out with the plants. And a lot of, um, she was just in the process of getting everything out. Here you can see the one that fell over is kind of still on its side there. Mother-in-law's tongues, she does a lot of cuttings. And so that's where a lot of her new plants come from. This is my yard. Uh, this was April one year. I hadn't filled in the containers yet. And just so you see what happens in May, this is what I'm looking so forward to. A lot of larkspur all over the place. The containers are all full and the top of the water, um, the waterfall of the planting area is all filled in. So this is so nice just to sit in the backyard and enjoy that. One thing I've really enjoyed every year is I've had this am amaryllis. I have like maybe seven or eight of them right in the, a row right here. This is that contained, um, very protected area. Usually they don't grow outside, but I have a whole row of them here in this pinkish color. And then in my daughter's garden, I have the red ones for her. And everyone says you can't grow amaryllis outside, but this is going on at least 10 years, maybe more than that. Here you see the enamel that I talked about that was a watering pitcher and a couple of little plants in there. So I wanna tell you about just a couple other things. One of them is the plant sale and tools and treasures. It's going on, it started today and it will continue Thursday, Friday, Saturday. On Saturday, they're gonna add a few things. The area garden clubs will be there. And then also there will be a tomato giveaway to the first 500 families that come. It's just a wonderful time. You can go outside and go through the farmer's market and then come inside and enjoy some uh, nice perennials and other plants or some tools and treasures. A lot of these publications and 
um, resources for you, I want you to get them from a place that's actually research based and not just oh the tattoo gardeners website um, or the gardening dad or you know something else where people are self proclaimed garden experts. So this is the address for container gardening handouts, growing flowers in pots. There's another one called growing vegetables in pots. And so it'll go over um, more details. And like, if you want some more ideas on different types of plants to use there. So bookstore.ksre, Kansas State Research and Extension. So there, and then um, another good source is we have something called the Prairie Star Program. And what that is, is a, a, they test out the plants and see which ones do the best in the Kansas. So that's another publication that's also available on that same site. There's hundreds of publications for you on there. Um, you just click on it and open it. If you want to print it off on your printer, you can right there. Or if you want to um, order it, you'll have to pay a couple of dollars or more. Uh, depending on like this is 12 pages so you may have to pay a little bit to get those but you can always just pull it up and read it, everything on there for free so reminder um, if you have any garden questions like at the end here you're going to ask me some hard questions and if i don't know the answer i'm going to say contact our garden hotline um, and they'll have some experts there and they can look up um, some of the answers for you so thank you so much i appreciate your time and i think we're doing pretty good on time we have, I have 709. And so I'm going to open it up to Sarah now. Yes, you, that was so much information. <laughs> but very, yeah. very useful. You yeah. know, for um, those of us who are eager to learn. Um, so first question was relating to that first slide that you had where you said, if you know what it is, throw it in the chat, I think. Um, and somebody suggested Monarda. Oh, it looks like it. The flower looks exactly like a Monarda flower, but I have a lot of Monarda in my yard and it has a very distinctive smell to it. And this is more of a house plant. So, or an annual that um, I keep it in a house plant in the fall and winter, but then take it out. But yeah, that is, that's a very, accurate description of the flower, but the leaves are different. Mm -hmm. Close. Um, and then uh, related to fertilizer, we've got a couple of questions. Do you fertilize even if the new mix has fertilizer in it? Should you add your own? Yeah, you need a little extra fertilizer for these kinds of pots, especially um, like if you think of all the rain that we've had on the last few days, I'm sure that the fertilizer that's been in the pot is probably washed out a little bit. Maybe some of the slow release will still be releasing, but tomorrow I'm gonna to give all my pots a big drink of fertilizer, half strength. I always do half strength, and then I don't worry about burning or over fertilizing those. Okay. And then even weekly, if it's, weekly. I'm sorry, say that again, Speaking. Diane? Weekly, weekly. Um, even if it's a two month release, do you do it every week? I do. Okay. There you have it. Um, do you use the three, one, two method for every plant, veggies, flowers, everything? No, I, I actually just use whatever I have. Okay. So sometimes I'll have um, the three, two, three, one, two, or sometimes I'll have like 10, 10, 10, or 20, 20, 20. Usually I mix it up. The three, one, two was what was recommended in one of the K-State publications to be the best for the container garden. Now in the ground, what you really need is a soil test and to know, because you may not, you may have a, a garden with a lot of organic material in there and not need any nitrogen. Or you may have so much phosphorus in there that it could cause pollution. And so you only want to put in the ground what you know that you need in there. But because the pots, you flush it through, the next time you water it, it just gets flushed through. So that's why it needs to be fertilized more. And I can't remember if any of our speakers, the series talked about doing a soil test. Um, do we, can you, can you talk about where they might be able to find information on how to do that? Yeah, both on the Kansas State website, it'll tell you how to do that. 
um, how to you take a sample in and you take a sample from different parts of that garden and mix it all in and bring it in. And there is a charge associated with that. But what they do is they do a chemical analysis of that and they'll know how much, if you need to add organic material or if that's correct, if you need to uh, add nitrogen, add a specific, they'll tell you exactly what you need to add to that. And so um, what you need to do is bring in a soil sample and bring it into the extension and then they'll help you um, fill out the form and send that off. Okay, thank you. Um, and just a quick tip, uh, kitty litter pails can also work as good as five gallon buckets. So that's true. And uh, would you please repost the slide about the sale this weekend? Yes. I did pop in the chat both the bookstore link that you gave and the uh, hotline email address. So yeah. that's at least something that you can copy and paste um, if you need to do so. That was all I could get before the slides moved over. So hopefully that captured the, the ones that were, were needed. Um, is it a good idea to try and seal the clay pot to help them contain moisture better? You can if you want to. Um, some people will paint it. Just make sure it's not a toxic material that would cause some problems with the, the plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then, oh, is the method for fertilizing vegetables um, in containers the same as flowers? Mm, I'm not sure exactly. Um, hmm. I, I'm sorry, I, I would have to look that one up. So uh, Susie, maybe that is a question to send to the extension office hotline. <laughs> Very good. Okay. And then um, this person is growing potatoes in a five gallon bucket. Do you have mm -hmm. any suggestions? Um, no. Are you asking for suggestions on producing the most potatoes or? She probably, she or he probably knows more than I do. I've never tried to grow potatoes in a container, um, but I'm sure it's a wonderful idea. What you need to do is just make sure it's a well-draining soil, um, well-draining potting mix and just, I'm not really sure anything else after that. Oh, variety? Variety of potato? We're kind of past the potato season right now. Usually people plant potatoes around St. Patrick's Day. Um, Rebecca from the extension office, our extension office agent today, says that she would recommend an early producing variety like a red Norland. So good. She's hopefully. the expert on vegetables and, and fruits. Yes. Thank you, Rebecca. And if you missed her talk last week on um, a fruitful gardening, you can catch that. We'll be putting it on our YouTube channel here in the next couple of weeks. Um, Rebecca, what about Yukon, uh, gold Yukon? I think those would do well in a bucket. Yeah, they'll be fine. Um, you know, potatoes and containers sometimes work really well and sometimes are kind of difficult. So it's, um, <clears throat> you just have to be a little bit patient with them and uh, see, kind of see what you get. Okay. Yep. Thank and you. And the, the sweet potatoes, um sweet potatoes you're going to want a large container like 15 or 30 gallons <laughs> you know some, something really big for a sweet potato that makes sense they're they're bigger so you'd want a bigger room for them um we've got one person doing dakota potatoes in feed bags that are doing really well so that's interesting to hear feed bags wouldn't have ever thought of that as a container
Uh, I have reached the end of my questions. So if you are holding on to one that you wanted to ask of our experts today, feel free to go ahead and type that into the old chat box and we'll, we'll address it. because We still do have about 12 minutes left of tonight's program. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm going to go ahead and just type in the um, evaluation link for tonight's program. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, it sometimes takes a minute to load, so give it a minute, but uh, then you can go ahead and fill it out. It shouldn't take very long. And just let us know if there's any other um, gardening programs you'd like to see or uh, programs in general. We really do appreciate your feedback. Well, I wanna say thanks, Sarah, for making this so easy for me. And thank you, Rebecca, for having everything set up. I've never done a live Zoom before where I was the host. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, it was it was pleasure learning from you. You, you acted like you were a pro. <laughs> Thanks. I'm always learning, though. Every day I learn new things about gardening. Well, if you knew everything, then that would just make life really boring, mm -hmm. though. So. <laughs> uh, we've got some thank yous rolling in. Um, we love our extension office and library, and we love all of our patrons. So I can't speak for the extension office, but I'm going to suggest that they probably feel the same way. Um, any other questions out there? I learned something every time too. <laughs> so that, that just came into the chat. Um, I'll make sure that Diane gets to see some of your, your nice comments. Um, and the other classes, I don't have dates on when those will be posted to YouTube, but um, we're kind of running in a, a one to two week window following the program. Um, so just kind of keep an eye out. And you can find those on our Wichita Public Library YouTube channel which I can type into the chat box while we're waiting for any additional questions. Uh, I think I, I heard that the, um, well, Diane, didn't you say that the one on composting was up? That was our very first one of this series. The first one was spring gardening. Getting oh, your you're right. You're right. It was spring gardening and we got composting up as well. So those two are up. Um, the, this, the later three uh, are still being worked on. And obviously this one, you know, we'll, we'll need a, a few minutes, few days to get it uploaded. So there is that. Well, um, I don't want to have any dead air. <laughs> so if we don't have any more questions, we'll go ahead and, and end a little early tonight. Um, but if you have any follow up questions, I know that um, Diane and the rest of the Master Gardeners would love to help you through that hotline service that they offer. What a great resource. So um, thank you to Diane. Thank you, Rebecca, and all of the staff at the uh, Extension Office here in Cedric County. We really love partnering with you on this series. So um, I'm so excited that we got to do it. And I'm so excited that we'll have another one in the fall. So keep a lookout um, and have a great night. All right. Stay dry. Woo. Okay, good night.